the sick physician by dorothy canfield this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org reading by matt perard the sick physician by dorothy canfield she had been at first quite the most insignificant element in the life of newton a subject of casual comment among the much occupied card-playing marthas of the little suburban village did you know that that new driver for hanneman's livery stable is married betty holt asked her partner mrs baldwin yes that tow-headed foreign-looking boy they say she's even younger than he did anybody make trumps and of all things they have a baby oh tcha! i didn't mean to play that ace then suddenly horribly she became an object of charity oh betty those pollocks that lived down near the railroad tracks he was thrown out by a runaway team and brought home dead and there isn't a cent in the house somebody's got to see to them can't you oh my dear i couldn't my nerves they say the widow is dreadful somebody told harry she tried to kill herself and they brought him home can't you go why my lace curtains are just half on the drying frames don't you suppose margaret wagner could her horrid husband is off again and there's nothing to keep her she's good at handling that sort of folks the widow is not more than a child herself after this there was a time when she was the tragically insoluble problem which a freak of circumstance threw inexorably into the hands of the busy bridge-playing suburban matrons she wanted but one thing the dark young creature with her girl's face set in steady anguish she asked but one boon of the well-dressed well-fed strangers who came and went through her one-roomed hut she cried out to them to allow her to take her child and follow her husband there was no other thought in the world for her she asked them the wondering shrinking half frightened fair ladies over and over in her passionate unintelligible speech what other course she could take if we could only talk to her cried maid baldwin what would you say to her if we could asked betty holt unanswerably it was the simplest thing in the world that was finally said to her but it bowed her slim unresigned shoulders to the burden of life mrs emory stealing an hour from little paul's invalid's room made the startling discovery that the poverty-stricken young polack knew french a pure fluent speech quite unlike the halting boarding-school jargon which was the common newton version of the language mrs emory then struggled with the half-forgotten phrases enough to make out that she also spoke german and ran to get margaret wagner half german herself that moody bitter-lipped kind-eyed woman took the rebellious child into her empty arms and cried unsparingly sei sind ein Hose. you are a bad woman your little girl may live to be as happy as you have been and you would keep her from it the widow of ignaz marvenka stiffened in the other's clasp would i have my child know this hour i now live she cried angrily margaret wagner held her off at arm's length and asked her piercingly if you could forget him and stop all your grief by forgetting him would you do it the other for an instant still faced her with hard fierce eyes of embittered desolation then the shaft went home for the first time she began to weep and to cry out sobbingly ach never never would i forget but you wish to refuse your child that precious thing you would not forget the widow flung herself down on the bed in passion of protest but it is too hard too hard to live ich kann es nicht je ne puis pas not even for my baby not even for lise elena margaret wagner knelt down beside her and said brokenly there are harder lives that other wives must live suppose he left you for other women suppose you had no child in all her married life she had never broken her proud silence before 
the long years of her endurance and her reticence looked out from her steady eyes and lighted sadly the path for the bleeding feet of lisa Barvinka. she had so shocked her staid and well-regulated neighbors little used to violent emotions that they did not leave her to the impersonal ministrations of charity as they did the other dwellers in the shanties by the railroad tracks the question of her future now began to occupy them as acutely as the question of persuading her to live had done she says she is willing to do anything to support lisalina sighed betty holt to mrs emory but she is so fearfully incompetent it drives me wild with nerves to have her round incompetent why didn't you know she can speak french and oh i mean incompetent for a woman of her class she's too ignorant ever to try to teach french she's too ignorant for any use in every way it's a literal fact that gretchen wagner had to show her how to hold a needle mrs emory shuddered and such a helpless child as that to be given the care of a baby her own life was spent in a black prison-house of anxiety over a frail little only son who threatened with every wind that blew to leave the loving hands that clung to him so desperately so desperately that life seemed but one long apprehension suppose lis elena should be delicate she shivered again well she's not a bit mrs holt reassured her she's a big fat blonde baby just as different from lisa as can be like the father i suppose well the only thing to do with lisa is to try to teach her something useful maybe she could learn to wait on table for extra help at dinner parties or something like that but she did not learn this or any other occupation which newton women had been taught to consider useful it was not for lack of faithful effort on their part and on hers day after day she brought her rosy yellow-haired child to the home of the holts the baldwins the wagners and the emerys and listened docilely to the instructions of those deft-handed housekeepers about sewing cooking washing dishes cleaning making fires darning stockings and to the last day of her service she performed all these operations as badly as at her first attempt you don't try mrs baldwin accused her one day she raised her fathomless black eyes i try to try she said pitifully in her painful newly learned english mrs botwin was connecticut born bred dried and seasoned and had no use for sentimentality in the practical matters of life i can't keep such a do-less creature she'd ruin us she said indignantly to mrs holt it was a critical period in lisa's affairs the four women who had somehow helplessly seemed to saddle themselves with the responsibility of her fate tried their best to evade this self-assumed burden their last attempt was to persuade her to let them write her family in poland for aid it was a subject they never mentioned to her again so startled were they by the feigned image of rage which she became at the suggestion in fact they never learned from her so much as the name she bore before her marriage they gathered the evident fact from her that she was highly educated and delicately bred and from hanneman the livery stable man only that her husband had been entirely the reverse of these things he couldn't read or write arvinga couldn't but he was an awful good sort of fellow for all that the finest driver i ever had he thought lots of his folks too there was more than twenty dollars in the purse us boys got up for the widow and do you know what that doggone fool woman went and did with it bought a gold locket to put a piece from his old coat in there wa not much more'n that left of him after the smash-up and a gold chain to hang it round her neck she says she's never going to take it off till she dies and the funeral expense is not paid no ma'am i can't tell you any more about marenka there were no other sources of information and they never knew any more they surmised endless romances about the circumstances which led to the heart-breaking happy union of the two so diverse creatures but only on one occasion did lisa by word or act throw any light on her past 
that occasion befell one day in december the year after her husband's death when she was sitting dully over a basket of darning in the emory house her four patronesses were gathered around the piano in the next room practicing in their chatty amateurish manner a christmas carol all the four had pleasant light untrained voices and occasionally furnished a musical number for the program of a home-made entertainment this was for the christmas party of the sunday school they had chosen an arrangement of a gonneau christmas chant and were now admitting the unwisdom of their choice with their usual comfortable acceptance of narrow limitations it was quite beyond their capacities they said unconcernedly to each other after fumbling through the first measures mrs emory the pianist of the group complained that the accompaniment was too hard for her and may bodwin protested at the height of the soprano part i can't sing a decent a you know i can't she broke off in the middle of a measure to remark conversationally and at the sound of a sudden explosive exclamation back of her turned to receive full face one of the most startling sensations of her life afterward each one confessed that she had felt as though a tigress had sprung out at her from a corner of the safe comfortable sitting-room lisa marenka stood before them her face very white her eyes very black her attitude tense as a slinger about to launch his bolt she flung it at them like an insult you do not try you are lazy with your breed you do not try they stared at her this violent imperious authority was no one they had ever seen they shrank from her as she darted in on mrs bodwin snatching off her belt and commanding with fury breathe breathe down here where is my hand deeper now again deeper now think high 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 she motioned passionately towards the zenith now another breath now Hieras. eh eh she struck the note on the piano and stamped her foot from the throat of the astonished mrs bodwin issued a clear resonant note such as never before in her life had she emitted you can you see lisa accused her you hypnotize me protested the matron still held by the other's flaming eyes if you try you can said mrs marenka scornfully all of you could she pushed mrs emory away from the piano stool and sat down striking without looking at the music the first chords of the accompaniment she gathered them up she swept them along with the quickly increasing impetus of the approach to the glorious opening melody she hurled them into song with one dynamic word of command sing she cried as though death were the only alternative and with one accord began the first rehearsal of the newton woman's quartet it lasted an hour sixty minutes of more intense life than the four married settled ladies had dreamed they were still capable of feeling their leader gave them no time to be self-conscious to wonder at themselves or at her they existed in the moment and the moment's impersonal affair was to cast out upon the air the audible embodiment of a noble spiritual truth nothing less would their commander receive from them she raged at them she pleaded with them she sang all their parts in turn pouring out a powerful perfectly trained young voice that flooded them and swept them away she coaxed them over difficult places she swooped down on them broad-winged and carried them up in eagle flights to peeling climaxes their cheeks were flushed as in their girlhood their eyes shone starlike they had forgotten their creeping everyday life may bodwin was oblivious to the high price of steak and the need of floor polish betty holt's nerves but made her the more sensitively alive to this new joy mrs emory paul's mother for the first time in years knew a beauty untarnished by fear and margaret wagner caught a glimpse of a door of escape from the humiliating bitterness of her life they were trembling in excitement they were singing beyond their wildest dreams of their capacities but above all they were penetrated dazzled drunk with the music 
with all their souls they were calling the world to forget its cares as they had forgotten theirs to worship with them the greatness of humility ardently they chanted the words though low be the chamber they sang fervently they were wavering agnostics lukewarm doubters all of them come in come in and adore they chanted with uplifted hearts ecstatic as a company of medieval saints their eyes fixed on lisa morenko's exalted face of command at the end there was a silence as they looked wonderingly at each other like travellers returned from a distant country lisa's cheeks were glistening with tears she wiped them away with a murmured explanation it is the first music i hear in so long at last they found their tongues their voices of everyday prose and cried out but you never told us that you are such a musician as she nodded simply ah yes it is all i know anything but that was i never taught you must give piano lessons this from mrs emory lisa looked up in astonishment as a fearing ridicule ach the piano i play not at all only little very bad to sing is what i they remembered her masterly management of the accompaniment and laughed you must give singing lessons then the widow clasped her hands for pay she was incredulous ecstasy they nodded amply ach to earn money for les helena cried the musician the others were holding a little aloof from her still overawed by her delphic visitation of inspiration for which as though it were the most obvious and expected of phenomena she vouchsafed no explanation or apology but at that moment occurred an incident which restored the balance of power mrs bodwin's maid-of-all-work burst in with lisa lena choking and strangling in her arms lisa sprang for the child with a piercing scream of terror and held it close to her heart turning eyes of idiotic terror on the others what to do what to do she cried wildly stand her on her head and shake her called mrs bodwin hastening towards them lisa tried tremblingly to obey but the heavy child slipped from her arms into a struggling heap on the floor over which she wrung impotent agonized hands this way so said mrs bodwin seizing the sufferer energetically reversing her under one arm and administering a series of sharp blows to her back there was a gurgle a gasp an indignant yell from lisa lena and a large bone button rolled on the floor lisa fell to her knees white and shaken crying out you save her from to die you are so wonder wise may bodwin laughed it is possible that at this moment they had all of them some half-conscious divination of what their relations were to be you teach us to sing all our songs like that one to-day and we'll take care of the baby for you she said so began a new phase in lisa's life she was called mrs marinka now and sometimes madame newton ladies thought the foreign title suited her type the number of her pupils increased rapidly and before long a chorus was organized under mrs bodwin's management although the other three of the original quartet feared for the success of this undertaking in the first place lisa insisted that the ladies learn for the first rehearsal a small part of one of the bach passions a strange ascetic choice which augured ill for a miscellaneous gathering of suburban ladies they were afraid too that the courage of their girlish leader might not suffice for the ordeal of facing so large a number of strangers and addressing them in a half-learned foreign tongue but at the first rehearsal as at all subsequent ones the same miracle took place the first chord of the accompaniment transformed the shrinking insignificant girl into a very napoleon of music masterful sure of herself inordinately demanding and inordinately giving forth she launched them upon the sea of harmony with a calm bold certainty she swept them from their niggling one two three countings out upon broad swelling waves of noble rhythm whose existence 
they had not suspected she sprang at their throats like a tiger cat at the least sign of flagging and drew from them impetuous crescendos and ringing climaxes which made the tears of excited pleasure come into their eyes she fell into a wide-eyed trance of tranquillity and hushed them to heavenly mild diminuados and never for an instant did she take from them the consuming fire of her eyes at the end after they had gone through a short session of the lamentations better sung a thousand times than any music newton had ever heard before she laid down the folded newspaper with which she had been beating time and dismissing them with a nod said wearily that was very very bad but better than at first and we will all do better next week the spell was over the women in the chorus drew long breaths and blinked rapidly returning with surprise to themselves to daylight to the ordinary world to each other well said a soprano to an alto who in everyday life was her sister you don't know how funny it seems to see you with your face and your hat and your gloves just as usual the other understood i know i felt the same way you were just a voice the young leader a sombre brooding figure in her straight black dress had come up to this group and was listening another woman said why i haven't felt so stirred up not since i was being courted i declare that was the way i did feel i thrilled as though i was falling in love again and my youngest is nine years old lisa laid her thin long-fingered hand on the other's shoulder that is music she said solemnly anything smaller than that is not music it is wicked sacrilege and to have that it is enough for any one to leave that is my credo flying this flag she went into single-handed combat with the entrenched forces of emotional and intellectual sloth and inertia and so harried baited and persecuted them that in six months time there was to the eye of the most casual observer a definite change in the moral atmosphere of the town the membership of the bridge clubs began to decline and the attendance of those who remained technically loyal to cards was uncertain women made fewer aimless shopping expeditions into the city the number of teas and receptions fell off a little and wardrobes were made ready for the changing seasons with a great abatement from the usual prayerful intensity of care there was so little time now their fanatical overseer whipped laggards into line and spurred the leaders forward delving with titanic energy in the pasture land of newton femininity madame marvinka blasted yawning cavities among the flowers and grasses and found gold and silver and precious stones which then with infinite patience she refined and chased and polished and set she discovered voices in the most unexpected personalities and having discovered them performed the far harder exploit of fanning their owners into a flame of purposeful energy margaret wagner's pleasant alto was found to be a powerful dramatic contralto the use and development of which was like pure air to an invalid sickened by long confinement through the medium of this safe new speech she poured out the bitterness which had so long clogged her heart and purging her bosom of the perilous stuff found that life had taught her other and sweeter things feeling an exalted sense of this one day she told her teacher now i see that it is true what you say art is enough even what we poor halfway bunglers may do and know of it it is enough reason for going on they had met in the street and lisa was in her unmusical incarnation a thin black-robed figure with deep-set lustreless eyes told i you that she asked fingering nervously the little golden locket she would always wear until she died told i you that it is enough mrs wagner wondered at her why you said it is your creed the foreigner thrust the locket inside the bosom of her dress and turned away 
oh yes it is my creed she murmured uncertainly she added bravely however a moment later please be early at the rehearse to-day mrs emory having but a tiny thread of a nondescript voice had insisted that the new teacher take up with her her half-forgotten piano in whose familiar black and white she saw under the new instruction strange meanings laboring over the keys she had sometimes blessed glimpses of a conception of harmony so all-embracing that every fact of life could enter into its great crescendos it is the first thing in my life since little paul's sickness that sets me free of terror she told madame marinka after an hour of searching ecstatic toil over a beethoven andante it makes me understand that life is so great that even death may not take all away from us the other sinuous fingers closed on her locket hard it was always in her hand she smiled waveringly she seemed for a moment even paler than usual ah you understand that you say she asked you understand that now she bent over her music suddenly to hide her face as she went out she paused in the doorway to say fiercely i must work more more it seemed to her four friends that no one could work harder than she at that time but in the months to come she outdid herself newton hummed like a great seashell with the echoes of her ceaseless song the men of the suburb were not enthusiastic naturally they thought of their wives as intended agreeably to supplement and embellish their own cobbled grubbings in the adjacent city music as vital self-expression as the dramatic outpourings of real and potential feeling music as the wings on which their well-tamed women folk took fiery flight for regions of emotion related in no way to their actual lives peacefully and inexorably circumscribed by the wedding ring this music they feared and distrusted as the devil's spark the author of the electrifying change they came as a body solidly to oppose she was a morbid foreigner they said and all that anybody knew about her was that evidently she had eloped with her father's coachman and that was the kind of woman she was they were consequently little disposed to sympathize with their wives in the joyful excitement which now fell upon those ladies as a result of a curious sequence of events unimportant in themselves somebody or others second cousin had married the brother of the manager of a company now producing opera in english the second cousin coming by chance to spend sunday in newton brought by chance her much bored managerial brother-in-law and he by chance hearing lisa marvenka was no longer bored but vastly startled from here on lisa's four protecting ladies could scarcely keep pace with a swirl of events he went to see lisa that afternoon and she sang for him again and he sent for lisa to come to his office in the city she came back to newton with her great tidings showing a faint smile at the exclamation of her ladies as she called them who were quite overcome with scared delight it was as though an eagle had soared up out of a hen-yard they felt lisa tried to moderate their excitement it was not the metropolitan she told them but if it pleases you if it pleases you i am to sing madame a butterfly come one time to see if i do it all right but only if i learn those english words so i speak dem good you can teach me dat english not they not only taught her that english but they did nothing for the next week but occupy themselves feverishly with preparations they made her kimonos for her with their own hands and the costume of lise eleno who was to be the child of the story they rehearsed the business of her part incessantly with her they trained lisalina in her role they held the book with endless patience to correct lisa's memory but anxious not to leave a stone unturned in the path of her success don't you think you would better take a lesson or two in the acting they asked her it will be all so new for you a flame leapt up in the midnight of her eyes no there is nothing new for me in that story it is a woman who lives without the husband she loves 
and then she kill herself because she have him not i know i know they feared among themselves that this time she was really overconfident they feared for her memory for her courage for her voice for her presence of mind if it had been their own debut they could not have known more hopeful and terrified hours on the night of the performance they took their seats with heavily beating hearts they thought that every nerve was strained for lisa and for lisa alone but they had not counted on the new magic of the world to which she had introduced them it was the first opera they had heard since the opening of their ears and with the beginning of the overture they entered once and for all fully into their kingdom of enchantment for a moment all their personal connection with the evening was gone from their minds they were lost in that finest most unearthly of all joys an impersonal impression of art it marked an epoch in their lives they heard they heard what the orchestra was proclaiming they distinguished the different voices of the different instruments as though archangels were calling to them they were aware of the rich texture of the harmony they caught the intricate pattern of modern orchestral music lisa and the abandon of her passion in the love duet of the first act's finale were for the moment to these listeners but parts of a glorious whole when the curtain went down however they came to themselves and silenced by the staccato outburst of applause clasped hands of rapt self-congratulation from their box they could catch glimpses of what was passing in the wings the impresario was shaking hands with lisa between her responses to the applause even to their inexperienced eyes it was plain that the prima donna was accepted the next act proved her more than that if her singing pleased the critics it was her acting which carried away the now aroused audience such yearning was in her demand for news of her husband such an exultation over the arrival of his ship glowed through the oriental dignity of her preparations for his homecoming that when the curtain fell on the pathetic scene of endless waiting and heartsick suspense the audience would not be denied a curtain call for a time the management refused but then against all tradition the impresario sent out his new find Les helena trotting by her side the house roared at their appearance there were shouts from the gallery of brava brava and a loud pattering storm of applause lisa walked across the stage holding her child by the hand and bowing her thanks as she passed near her friends she looked into the half obscurity of their box her painted face glaringly lighted by the footlights their enthusiastic hand-clapping stopped suddenly the smiles of pride and relief and pleasure were stricken from their faces they shrank together staring at the expression of her eyes strange in the smiling mask she held up to the audience she lifted for them to see from where it swung low on the breast of her kimono the little golden locket the locket which was always in her hand she disappeared Lisalena skipping in delight to see their kind familiar faces the curtain rose the four ladies did not stir once during the intolerable pathos of that last scene at the unsheathing of the dagger betty holt caught a sharp breath but her eyes did not waver the child came running in there was the heart-breaking passage of pretty tender desolated mother chatter while its eyes were bandaged and the dishonored flag set in its hand the orchestra sent out a sinister note and the woman without a husband passed quietly behind the screen the blindfolded child played smilingly with the doll and waved the little flag the violins filled the hearts of the listeners with ill-omened chords with tragic and dissonant cadences the four women in the box were white to the lips the music changed the other actors came running on the stage the screen was cast down showing the huddled prostrate figure in the kimono the blindfolded child was carried off the curtain went down it was a thoroughly dramatic rendition of that most dramatic finale the four ladies in the box sat motionless staring before them from behind the curtain came an ominous sound of hurrying feet startled shocked voices they leaned forward straining their ears 
about them the well-pleased audience stirred and murmured and caught its breath in satisfaction over an artistic triumph scraps of talk drifted into the box a consummate singer pronounced the thin-faced elderly man who had taken notes all through the performance the friends of the prima donna had conjectured him an influential music critic i never heard that aria before the suicide more admirably phrased from a group of enthusiastic music students whose heads had been bent over the score of the opera came a girl's fervent voice what more could anybody want in the world than to be able to do that mrs bodwin turned her head what are we waiting for she asked challengingly they looked at each other and made no answer the door at the back of the box opened and lisa lena burst in the black wig gone from her yellow hair her eyes dancing i dot a box of candy she chanted holding it up at them triumphantly the fat man gave it to me for not laughing when he wiggled his nose i didn't this time did i where is your mother asked mrs emory in a frightened voice lisa looked about her with cheerful vagueness oh back there i des she told me this morning that as soon as the man carried me out to run along to you she said i was to go home with you she said you would take care of me betty holt's hand went to her throat did she did she tell you anything else lisa Lena nodded yes she did her eyes wandered over the audience oh see that lady with d what did she say what did she say they bent over her urgently why why oh yes she said to tell you that her part was so hard for her to play she'd have to rest now from behind the curtain came an ominous sound of slow feet stepping heavily weighted with a burden the four pale motherly women closed about the smiling little girl shielding her from the stage margaret wagner stifled a cry and knelt down by the singer's child what is this thing around your neck she asked in a horrified whisper my mamma put it around my neck said lisa elena it was the little golden locket end of the sick physician by dorothy canfield Some Scotland Yard Stories by Sir Robert Anderson This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Tomlinson Some Scotland Yard Stories by Sir Robert Anderson When I took charge of the Criminal Investigation Department, I was no novice in matters relating to criminals and crime. In addition to experience gained at the bar and on the prison commission, secret service work had kept me in close touch with Scotland Yard for twenty years, and during all that time I had the confidence not only of the chiefs but of the principal officers of the detective force. I thus entered on my duties with very exceptional advantages. I was not a little surprised, therefore, to find occasion to suspect that one of my principal subordinates was trying to impose on me as though I were an ignoramus. For when any important crime of a certain kind occurred, and I set myself to investigate it, a la Sherlock Holmes, he used to listen to me in the way that so many people listen to sermons in church, and when I was done he would stolidly announce that the crime was the work of A, B, C, or D, naming some of his stock heroes. Though a keen and shrewd police officer, the man was unimaginative, and I thus accounted for the fact that his list was always brief, and that the same names came up repeatedly. It was Old Car, or Worth, or Sausage, or Shrimps, or Quiet Joe, or Red Bob, etc., etc., one name or another being put forward according to the kind of crime I was investigating. It was easy to test my prosaic subordinate statements by methods with which I was familiar in secret service work, and I soon found that he was generally right. Great crimes are the work of great criminals, and great criminals are very few, 
and by great crimes i mean not crimes that loom large in the public view because of their moral heinousness but crimes that are the work of skilled and resourceful criminals the problem in such cases is not to find the offender in a population of many millions but to pick him out from among a few definitely known specialists in the particular sort of crime under investigation a volume might be filled with cases to illustrate my meaning but a very few must here suffice it fell upon a day for example that a ladder larceny was committed at a country house in cheshire it was the usual story while the family were at dinner the house was entered by means of a ladder placed against a bedroom window all outer doors and ground floor windows having been fastened from outside by screws or wire or rope and wires were stretched across the lawn to baffle pursuit in case the thieves were discovered the next day the chief constable of the county called on me for as he said such a crime was beyond the capacity of provincial practitioners and he expected us to find the delinquents among our pets at scotland yard he gave me a vague description of two strangers who had been seen near the house the day before and in return i gave him three photographs two of these were promptly identified as the men who had come under observation arrest and conviction followed and the criminals received a punishment suited to their sin one of them was quiet joe the other his special pal their sentences expired about the time of my retirement from office and thus my official acquaintance with them came to an end but in the newspaper reports of a similar case the year after i left office i recognized my old friends rascals of this type are worth watching and the police had noticed that they were meeting at the lambeth free library where their special study was provincial directories and books of reference they were tracked to a bookshop where they bought a map of bristol and to other shops where they procured the plant for a ladder larceny they then booked for bristol and there took observations of the suburban house they had fixed upon at this stage the local detectives to whom of course the metropolitan officers were bound to give the case declared themselves and seized the criminals and the case was disposed of by a nine-month sentence on a minor issue most people can be wise after the event but even that sort of related wisdom seems lacking to the legislature and the law if on the occasion of their previous conviction these men had been asked what they would do on the termination of their sentence they would have answered why go back to business of course what else and at bristol they would have replied with equal frankness on that occasion they openly expressed their gratification that the officers did not wait to catch them fair on the job as another long stretch would about finish them a playful allusion to the fact that as they were both in their seventh decade another penal servitude sentence would have seen the end of them whereas their return to the practice of their calling was only deferred for a few months meanwhile they would live without expense and a paternal government would take care of the money found in their pockets on their arrest would be restored to them on their release to enable them to buy more jimmies and wires and screws so that no time would be lost in getting to work such is our punishment of crime system quiet joe made a good income by the practice of his profession but he was a thriftless fellow who spent his earnings freely and never paid income tax old carr was a different type the man never did an honest day's work in his life he was a thief a financier and trainer of thieves and a notorious receiver of stolen property but though his wealth was ill-gotten he knew how to hoard it upon his last conviction i was appointed statutory administrator of his estate i soon discovered that he owned a good deal of valuable house property but this i declined to deal with and took charge only of his portable securities for money the value of this part of his estate may be estimated by the fact on his discharge he brought an action against me for maladministration of it claiming five thousand damages and submitting detailed accounts in support of his claim mr augustine birrell was my leading counsel in the suit and i may add that though the old rascal carried his case to the court of appeal he did not get his five thousand pounds the man lived in crime and by crime 
and old though he was, he was born in 1828, and rolling in wealth, he at once resumed the practice of his profession. He was arrested abroad this year during a trip taken to dispose of some stolen notes, the proceeds of a Liverpool crime, and his evil life came to an end in a foreign prison. When I refused to deal with Carr's house property, I allowed him to nominate a friend to take charge of it, and he nominated a brother professional, a man of the same kidney as himself, known in police circles as Sausage. A couple of years later, however, I learned from the tenants that the agent had disappeared, and that their cheques for rent had been returned to them. I knew what that meant, and at once instituted inquiries to find the man, first in the metropolis and then throughout the provinces. But my inquiries were fruitless. I learned, however, that when last at Scotland Yard, the man had said, with emphasis, that he would never again do anything at home. This was in answer to a warning and an appeal, a warning that he would get no mercy if again brought to justice, and an appeal to change his ways, as he had made his pile and could afford to live in luxurious idleness. With this clue to guide me, I soon learned that the man's insatiable zest for crime had led him to cross the channel in hope of finding a safer sphere of work and that he was serving a sentence in a french prison no words surely can be needed to point the moral of cases such as these the criminals who keep society in a state of siege are as strong as they are clever if the risk of a few years penal servitude on conviction gave place to the certainty of final loss of liberty, these professionals would put up with the tedium of an honest life. Lombroso theories have no application to such men. Benson of the famous Benson and Kerr frauds was the son of an English clergyman. He was a man of real ability, of rare charms of manner and address, and an accomplished linguist. Upon the occasion of one of Madame Patty's visits to America, he ingratiated himself with the customs officers at New York, and thus got on board the liner before the arrival of the reception committee. He was, of course, a stranger to the great singer, but she was naturally charmed by his appearance and bearing, and the perfection of his Italian, and she had no reason to doubt that he had been commissioned for the part he played so acceptably and when the reception committee arrived they assumed that he was a friend of madame patty's upon his arm it was therefore that she leaned when disembarking and this was done with a view to carry out a huge fraud the detection of which eventually brought him to ruin the man was capable of filling any position but the life of adventure and ease which a criminal career provided had a fascination for him facts like these failed to convince dr max nordau when he called upon me years ago at his last visit i put his type theory to a test i had two photographs so covered that nothing showed but the face and telling him that one was an eminent public man and the other a notorious criminal i challenged him to say which was the type he shirked my challenge for as a matter of fact the criminal's face looked more benevolent than the other and it was certainly as strong. The one was Raymond alias Worth, the most eminent of the criminal fraternity of my time, and the other was Archbishop Temple. Need I add my story is intended to discredit not his grace of Canterbury, but the Lombroso type theory. Raymond, like Benson, had a respectable parentage, in early manhood he was sentenced to a long term of imprisonment for a big crime committed in New York, but he escaped and came to England. His schemes were Napoleonic. His most famous coup was a great diamond robbery. His cupidity was excited by the accounts of the Kimberley mines. He sailed for South Africa, visited the mines, accompanied a convoy of diamonds to the coast, and investigated the whole problem on the spot. Dick Turpin would have recruited a body of bush rangers and seized one of the convoys. But the methods of the sportsman-like criminal of our day are very different. The arrival of the diamonds at the coast was time to catch the mail steamer for England, and if a convoy were accidentally delayed en route, the treasure had to lie in the post office till the next mail left. Raymond's plan of campaign was soon settled. He was a man who could make his way in any company and he had no difficulty in obtaining wax impressions of the postmaster's keys. 
The postmaster, indeed, was one of a group of admiring friends whom he entertained at dinner the evening before he sailed for England. Some months later he returned to South Africa under a clever disguise and an assumed name, and made his way up country to a place at which the diamond convoys had to cross a river ferry on their way to the coast. Unshipping the chain of the ferry, he let the boat drift downstream, and the next convoy missed the mail steamer. Ninety thousand pounds worth of diamonds had to be deposited in the strong room of the post office, and those diamonds ultimately reached England in Raymond's possession. He afterward boasted that he sold them to their lawful owners in Hatton Garden. If I had ever possessed ninety thousand pounds worth of anything, the government would have had to find someone else to look after Fenians and burglars. But Raymond loved his work for its own sake, and though he lived in luxury and style, he kept to it to the last, organizing and financing many an important crime. A friend of mine who has a large medical practice in one of the London suburbs told me once of an extraordinary patient of his. The man was a dives and lived sumptuously, but he was extremely hypochondriacal. Every now and then an urgent summons would bring the doctor to the house to find the patient in bed, though with nothing whatever the matter with him. But the man always insisted on having a prescription, which was promptly sent to the chemist. My friend's last summons had been exceptionally urgent, and on his entering the room with unusual abruptness, the man sprang up in bed and covered him with a revolver. I might have relieved his curiosity by explaining that this eccentric patient was a prince amongst criminals. Raymond knew that his movements were matter of interest to the police, and if he had reason to fear that he had been seen in dangerous company, he bolted home and shammed sick and the doctor's evidence confirmed by the chemist's books would prove that he was ill in bed after the hour at which the police supposed they had seen him miles away. Raymond it was who stole the famous Gainsborough picture for which Mr. Agnew had recently paid the record price of £10,000. I may here say that the owner acted very well in this matter. Though the picture was offered him more than once on tempting terms, he refused to treat for it, save with the sanction of the police and it was not until I intimated to him that he might deal with the thieves that he took steps for its recovery. The story of another crime will explain my action in this case. The Channel Gang of Thieves mentioned on a previous page sometimes went for larger game than purses and pocketbooks. They occasionally robbed the treasure chest of the mail steamer when a parcel of valuable securities was passing from London to Paris. Tidings reached me that they were planning a coup of this kind upon a certain night, and I ascertained by inquiry that a city insurance company meant to send a large consignment of bonds to Paris on the night in question. How the thieves got the information is a mystery. Their organisation must have been admirable. But Scotland Yard was a match for them. I sent officers to Dover and Calais to deal with the case, and the men were arrested on landing at Calais but they were taken empty-handed. A capricious order of the railway company's marine superintendent at Dover had changed the steamer that night an hour before the time of sailing, and while upon the thieves was found a key for the treasure chest of the advertised boat, they had none for the boat in which they had actually crossed. But, mirabile dictu, during the passage they had managed to get a wax impression of it, we also got hold of a cloakroom ticket for a portmanteau which was found to contain some £2,000 worth of coupons stolen by the gang on a former trip. The men included in the bag were Shrimps, Red Bob and an old sinner named Powell. But the criminal law is skilfully framed in the interest of criminals and it was impossible to make a case against them. I succeeded, however, by dint of urgent appeals to the French authorities in having them kept in jail for three months. And now for the point of my story. Powell had left a blank cheque with his wife to be used in case he came to grief. And on his return to England he found she had been false to him. She had drawn out all his money and gone off with another man. And the poor old rascal died of want in the streets of Southampton. He it was who was Raymond's accomplice in stealing Mr. Agnew's picture, and with his death all hope of a prosecution came to an end. 
If my purpose here were to amuse, I might fill many a page with narratives of this kind, but my object is to expose the error and folly of our present system of dealing with crime. When a criminal court claims to anticipate the judgment of the great assize in the case of a hooligan convicted of some vulgar act of violence, the silliness and profanity of the claim may pass unnoticed. But when the punishment of crime system is applied to criminals of the type here described, the imbecility of it must be apparent to all. With such men, crime is the business of their lives. They delight in it. Their zest for it never flags, even in old age. What leads men like Raymond or Carr to risk a sentence of penal servitude is not a sense of want, that is a forgotten memory, nor is it even a craving for filthy lucre. The controlling impulse is a love of sport, for every great criminal is a thorough sportsman, and in the case of a man who is free from the weakness of having a conscience, it is not easy to estimate the fascination of a life of crime. Fancy the long-sustained excitement of planning and executing crimes like Raymond's. In comparison with such sport, hunting wild game is work for savages, salmon fishing and grouse shooting for lunatics and idiots. The theft of the gold cup at Ascot illustrates what I am saying here. The thieves arrived in motor cars. They were, we are told, of gentlemanly appearance and immaculately dressed, and they paid their way into the grand stand. The list of criminals of that type is a short one, and no one need suppose that such men would risk penal servitude for the paltry sum the cup would fetch. A crime involving far less risk would bring them ten times as much booty, for no winner of the cup ever derived more pleasure from the possession of it than the thieves must have experienced as they drove to London with the treasure under the seat of their motor-car for it was not the lust of filthy lucre, but the love of sport that incited them to the venture. There are hundreds of our undergraduates who would eagerly emulate the feat, were they not deterred by its dangers, and a rule of three sum may explain my proposal to put an end to such crimes. Let the consequences to the professional criminals be made equal to what imprisonment would mean to a varsity man, and the thing is done. End of Some Scotland Yard Stories by Sir Robert Anderson Recording by Peter Tomlinson, London, 2017
The Unrest Cure by H. H. Munro Saki. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Tomlinson, London. The Unrest Cure by H. H. Munro. On the rack in the railway carriage immediately opposite Clovis was a solidly wrought travelling bag with a carefully written label on which it was inscribed J. P. Huddle, the Warren, Tilfield, near Sloughborough. Immediately below the rack sat the human embodiment of the label, a solid, sedate individual, sedately dressed, sedately conversational. Even without his conversation, which was addressed to a friend seated by his side, and touched chiefly on such topics as the backwardness of Roman hyacinths and the prevalence of measles in the rectory, one could have gauged fairly accurately the temperament and mental outlook of the travelling bag's owner. But he seemed unwilling to leave anything to the imagination of a casual observer, and his talk grew presently personal and introspective. I don't know how it is, he told his friend. I'm not much over forty, but I seem to have settled down into a deep groove of elderly middle age. My sister shows the same tendency. We like everything to be exactly in its accustomed place. We like things to happen exactly at their appointed times. We like everything to be usual, orderly, punctual, methodical, and to a hair's breadth, to a minute. It distresses and upsets us if it is not so. For instance, to take a very trifling matter, a thrush has built its nest year after year in the catkin tree on the lawn. This year, for no obvious reasons, it is building in the ivy on the garden wall. We have said very little about it, but I think we both feel that the change is unnecessary and just a little irritating. Perhaps, said the friend, it is a different thrush. We have suspected that, said J.P. Huddle and I think it gives us even more cause for annoyance. We don't feel we want a change of thrush at our time of life. And yet, as I have said, we have scarcely reached an age when these things should make themselves seriously felt. What you want, said the friend, is an unrest cure. An unrest cure? I never heard of such a thing. You've heard of rest cures for people who've broken down under the stress of too much worry and strenuous living, while well, you're suffering from overmuch repose and placidity, and you need the opposite kind of treatment. But where would one go for such a thing? Well, you might stand as an orange candidate for Kilkenny, or do a course of district visiting in one of the Apache quarters of Paris, or give lectures in Berlin to prove that most of Wagner's music was written by Gambetta, and there's always the interior of Morocco to travel in, but to be really effective, the unrest cure ought to be tried in the home. How you would do it, I haven't the faintest idea. It was at this point in the conversation that Clovis became galvanised into alert attention. After all, his two days' visit to an elderly relative at Slowborough did not promise much excitement. Before the train had stopped, he had decorated his sinister shirt cuff with the inscription, J. P. Huddle, the Warren, Tilfield, near Slowborough. Two mornings later, Mr. Huddle broke in on his sister's privacy as she sat reading Country Life in the morning room. It was her day and hour and place for reading Country Life, and the intrusion was absolutely irregular. But he bore in his hand a telegram, and in that household telegrams were recognised as happening by the hand of God. This particular telegram partook of the nature of a thunderbolt. Bishop examining confirmation class in neighbourhood, unable stay rectory on account measles invokes your hospitality, sending secretary a range. I scarcely know the bishop. I've only spoken to him once, exclaimed J.P. Huddle, with the actual potating air of one who realises too late the indiscretion of speaking to strange bishops. Miss Huddle was the first to rally. She disliked thunderbolts as fervently as her brother did, but the womanly instinct in her told her that thunderbolts must be fed. We can carry the cold duck, she said, 
It was not the appointed day for curry, but the little orange envelope involved a certain departure from rule and custom. Her brother said nothing, but his eyes thanked her for being brave. A young gentleman to see you, announced the parlourmaid. The secretary, murmured the huddles in unison. They instantly stiffened into a demeanour which proclaimed that, though they held all strangers to be guilty, they were willing to hear anything they might have to say in their defence. The young gentleman who came into the room with a certain elegant haughtiness was not at all Huddle's idea of a bishop's secretary. He had not supposed that the Episcopal establishment could have afforded such an expensively upholstered article when there were so many other claims on its resources. The face was fleetingly familiar. If he had bestowed more attention on the fellow traveller sitting opposite him in the railway carriage two days before, he might have recognised Clovis in his present visitor. "'You are the bishop's secretary?' asked Huddle, becoming consciously deferential. "'His confidential secretary,' answered Clovis. "'You may call me Stanislaus. My other name doesn't matter. "'The bishop and Colonel Alberti may be here to lunch.' I shall be here in any case. It sounded rather like the programme of a royal visit. The bishop is examining a confirmation class in the neighbourhood, isn't he? asked Miss Huddle. Ostensibly, was the dark reply, followed by a request for a large-scale map of the locality. Clovis was still immersed in a seemingly profound study of the map when another telegram arrived. It was addressed to... Prince Stanislas Care of Huddle, the Warren, etc. Clovis glanced at the contents and announced, The Bishop and Alberti won't be here till late in the afternoon. Then he returned to his scrutiny of the map. The luncheon was not a very festive function. The princely secretary ate and drank with fair appetite, but severely discouraged conversation. At the finish of the meal, he broke suddenly into a radiant smile, thanked his hostess for a charming repast, and kissed her hand with deferential rapture. Miss Huddle was unable to decide in her mind whether the action savoured of Louis Portorsian courtliness or the reprehensible Roman attitude towards the Sabine women. It was not her day for having a headache, but she felt that the circumstances excused her, and retired to her room, to have as much headache as possible before the bishop's arrival. Clovis, having asked the way to the nearest telegraph office, disappeared presently down the carriage drive. Mr. Huddle met him in the hall some two hours later and asked when the bishop would arrive. He is in the library with Alberti, was the reply. But why wasn't I told? I never knew he had come, exclaimed Huddle. "'No one knows he is here,' said Clovis. "'The quieter we can keep matters, the better, "'and on no account disturb him in the library. "'Those are his orders. "'But what is all this mystery about, "'and who is Alberti, "'and isn't the bishop going to have tea?' "'The bishop is out for blood, not tea.' "'Blood?' gasped Huddle, "'who did not find that the thunderbolt "'improved on acquaintance.' "'Tonight is going to be a great night in the history of Christendom,' said Clovis. "'We are going to massacre every Jew in the neighbourhood. "'To massacre the Jews?' said Huddle indignantly. "'Do you mean to tell me there's a general rising against them?' "'No, it's the bishop's own idea. "'He's in there arranging all the details now. "'But the bishop is such a tolerant, humane man.' That is precisely what will heighten the effect of his action. The sensation will be enormous. That at least Huddle could believe. He will be hanged, he exclaimed with conviction. A motor is waiting to carry him to the coast where a steam yacht is in readiness. There aren't thirty Jews in the whole neighbourhood, protested Huddle, whose brain, under the repeated shocks of the day, was operating with the uncertainty of a telegraph wire during earthquake disturbances. "'We have twenty-six on our list,' said Clovis, referring to a bundle of notes. "'We shall be able to deal with them all the more thoroughly.' "'Do you mean to tell me that you are meditating violence against a man 
like Sir Leon Burberry, stammered Huddle. He is one of the most respected men in the country. He's down on our list, said Clovis carelessly. After all, we've got men we can trust to do our jobs, so we shan't have to rely on local assistance. And we've got some Boy Scouts helping us as it was Hillary's. Boy Scouts? Yes, when they understood there was a real killing to be done, they were even keener than the men. This thing will be a blot on the twentieth century. And your house will be the blotting pad. Have you realised that half the papers of Europe and the United States will publish pictures of it? By the way, I've sent some photographs of you and your sister that I found in the library to the Matan and Die Vosch. I hope you don't mind. Also a sketch of the staircase. Most of the killing will probably be done on the staircase. The emotions that were surging in J.P. Huddle's brain were almost too intense to be disclosed in speech, but he managed to gasp out, There aren't any Jews in this house. Not at present, said Clovis. I shall go to the police, shouted Huddle with sudden energy. In the shrubbery, said Clovis, are posted ten men who have orders to fire on anyone who leaves the house without my signal of permission. Another armed piquette is in an ambush near the front gate. The Boy Scouts watched the back premises. At this moment the cheerful hoot of a motor horn was heard from the drive. Huddle rushed to the hall door with the feeling of a man half awakened from a nightmare and beheld Sir Leon Burberry, who had driven himself over in his car. I got your telegram, he said. What's up? Telegram? It seemed to be a day of telegrams. Come here at once. Urgent, James Huddle was the purport of the message displayed before Huddle's bewildered eyes. "'I see it all,' he exclaimed suddenly in a voice shaken with agitation, and with a look of agony in the direction of the shrubbery, he hauled the astonished Burberry into the house. Tea had just been laid in the hall, but the now thoroughly panic-stricken Huddle dragged his protesting guest upstairs, and in a few minutes' time the entire household had been summoned to that region of momentary safety.' Clovis alone graced the tea-table with his presence. The fanatics in the library were evidently too immersed in their monstrous machinations to dally with the solace of teacup and hot toast. Once the youth rose, in answer to the summons of the front doorbell, and admitted Mr. Paul Isaacs, shoemaker and parish councillor, who had also received a pressing invitation to the Warren. With an atrocious assumption of courtesy, which a Borgia could hardly have outdone, the secretary escorted this new captive of his net to the head of the stairway, where his involuntary host awaited him, and then ensued a long ghastly vigil of watching and waiting. Once or twice Clovis left the house to stroll across to the shrubbery, returning always to the library, for the purpose evidently of making a brief report. Once he tore in the letters from the evening postman and brought them to the top of the stairs with punctilious politeness. After his next absence, he came halfway up the stairs to make an announcement. The Boy Scouts mistook my signal and I've killed the postman. I've had very little practice in this sort of thing, you see. Another time I shall do better. The housemaid, who was engaged to be married to the evening postman, gave way to clamorous grief. Remember that your mistress has a headache, said J.P. Huddle. Miss Huddle's headache was worse. Clovis hastened downstairs, and after a short visit to the library returned with another message. The bishop is sorry to hear that Miss Huddle has a headache. He is issuing orders that as far as possible no firearms shall be used near the house. Any killing that is necessary on the premises will be done with cold steel. The bishop does not see why a man should not be a gentleman as well as a Christian. That was the last they saw of Clovis. It was nearly seven o'clock, and his elderly relative liked him to dress for dinner. But though he had left them for ever, the lurking suggestion of his presence haunted the lower regions of the house during the long hours of the wakeful night. And every creak on the stairway, every rustle of wind through the shrubbery, was fraught with horrible meaning. At about seven next morning the gardener's boy and the early postman finally convinced the watchers that the twentieth century was still unblotted. 
I don't suppose, mused Clovis, as an early train bore him townwards, that they will be in the least grateful for the unrest cure. End of the Unrest Cure by H. H. Munro Recording by Peter Tomlinson Where the Tides Ebb and Flow From A Dreamer's Tale by Lord Dunsinay This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman where the tides ebb and flow by lord dunsinay i dreamt that i had done a horrible thing so that burial was to be denied me either in soil or sea neither could there be any hell for me i waited for some hours knowing this then my friends came for me and slew me secretly with the ancient rite and lit great tapers and carried me away it was all in London that the thing was done, and they went furtively at the dead of night along grey streets and among mean houses until they came to the river, and the river and the tide of the sea were grappling with one another between the mud banks, and both of them were black and full of lights. A sudden wonder came to the eyes of each as my friends came near to them with their glaring tapers. All these things I saw as they carried me dead and stiffening, for my soul was still among my bones, because there was no hell for it, and because Christian burial was denied me. They took me down a stairway that was green with slimy things, and so came slowly to the terrible mud. There, in the territory of forsaken things, they dug a shallow grave. When they had finished, they laid me in the grave, and suddenly they cast their tapers to the river. And when the water had quenched the flaring lights, the tapers looked pale and small as they bobbed upon the tide. And at once the glamour of the calamity was gone, and I noticed then the approach of the huge dawn. And my friends cast their cloaks over their faces, and the solemn procession was turned into many fugitives that furtively stole away. Then the mud came back wearily and covered all but my face. There I lay alone with quite forgotten things, with drifting things that the tides will take no further, with useless things and lost things, and with the horrible unnatural bricks that were neither stone nor soil. I was rid of feelings because I had been killed, but perception and thought were in my unhappy soul. The dawn widened and I saw the desolate houses that crowded the marge of the river, and their dead windows peered into my dead eyes, windows with bales behind them, instead of human souls. I grew so weary looking at these forlorn things that I wanted to cry out, but could not because I was dead. Then I knew, as I had never known before, that for all the years that herd of desolate houses had wanted to cry out too, but being dead were dumb and i knew then that it had yet been well with the forgotten drifting things if they had wept but they were eyeless and without life and i too tried to weep but there were no tears in my dead eyes and i knew then that the river might have cared for us might have caressed us might have sung to us but he swept broadly onward thinking of nothing but the princely ships. At last the tide did what the river would not, and came and covered me over. And my soul had rest in the green water, and rejoiced and believed that it had burial at sea. But the ebb of the water fell again and left me alone again, with the callous mud, among forgotten things that drift no more, and with the sight of all those desolate houses and with the knowledge among all of us that each was dead. In the mournful wall behind me, hung with green weeds, forsaken of the sea, dark tunnels appeared, and the secret narrow passages that were clamped and barred. From these at last the stealthy rats came down to nibble me away, and my soul rejoiced thereat, and believed that he would be free perforce 
from the accursed bones to which the burial was refused. Very soon the rats ran away a little space and whispered among themselves. They never came any more. When I found that I was accursed even among the rats, I tried to weep again. Then the tide came swinging back and covered the dreadful mud and hid the desolate houses and soothed the forgotten things, and my soul had ease for a while in the sepulchre of the sea, and then the tide forsook me again. To and fro it came about me for many years. Then the county council found me and gave me decent burial. It was the first grave that I had ever slept in. That very night my friends came for me. They dug me up and put me back again in the shallow hold in the mud. Again and again through the years my bones found burial, but always behind the funeral lurked one of those terrible men who, as soon as night fell, came and dug them up and carried them back again to the hole in the mud. And then, one day, the last of those men died, who had once done to me this terrible thing. I heard his soul go over the river at sunset and again I hoped. A few weeks afterward I was found once more, and once more taken out of the restless place, and given deep burial in sacred ground, where my soul hoped that it should rest. Almost at once men came with cloaks and tapers, and gave me back to the mud, for the thing had become a tradition and a rite and all the forsaken things mocked me in their dumb hearts when they saw me carried back, for they were jealous of me, because I had left the mud. It must be remembered that I could not weep. And the years went by seawards where the black barges go, and the great derelict sentries became lost at sea, and still I lay there without any cause to hope, and daring not to hope without a cause because of the terrible envy and the anger of the things that could drift no more. Once a great storm rose up, even as far as London, out of the sea from the south, and he came curving into the river with the fierce east wind, and he was mightier than the dreary tides, and went with great leaps over the listless mud, and all the sad forgotten things rejoiced, and mingled with the things that were haughtier than they, and rode once more amongst the lordly shipping that was driven up and down. And out of their hideous home he took my bones, never again, I hope, to be vexed with the ebb and flow. And with the fall of the tide he went riding down the river, and turned to the southwards, and so went to his home. And my bones he scattered among many isles, and along the shores of happy alien mainlands, and for a moment, while they were far asunder, my soul was almost free. Then there arose at the will of the moon the assiduous flow of the tide, and it undid at once the work of the ebb, and gathered my bones from the marge of the sunny isles, and gleaned them all along the mainland's shore, and went rocking northwards, till it came to the mouth of the Thames and there turned westward its relentless face, and so went up the river, and came to a hole in the mud, and into it dropped my bones, and partly the mud covered them, and partly it left them white, for the mud cares not for its forsaken things. Then the ebb came, and I saw the dead eyes of the houses and the jealousy of the other forgotten things that the storm had not carried thence. And some more centuries passed over the ebb and flow, and over the loneliness of the things forgotten. And I lay there all the while, in the careless grip of the mud, never wholly covered, yet never able to go free. And I longed for the great caress of the warm earth, or the comfortable lap of the sea. Sometimes men found my bones and buried them, but the tradition never died, and my friend's successors always brought them back. At last the barges went no more, and there were fewer lights. Shaped timbers no longer floated down the fairway, and there came instead old wind-uprooted trees in all their natural simplicity. At last I was aware that somewhere near me a blade of grass was growing, and the moss began to appear all over the dead houses. 
One day some thistledown went drifting over the river. For some years I watched these signs attentively, until I became certain that London was passed away. Then I hoped once more, and all along both banks of the river there was anger amongst the lost things, that anything should dare to hope upon the forsaken mud. Gradually the horrible houses crumbled, until the poor dead things that had never had life got decent burial among the weeds and moss. At last the may appeared and the convolvulus. Finally the wild rose stood up over the mounds that had been wharves and warehouses. Then I knew that the cause of nature had triumphed, and London had passed away. The last man in London came to the wall by the river, in an ancient cloak that was one of those that my friends had worn, and peered over the edge to see that I was still there. Then he went, and I never saw men again. They had passed away with London. A few days after the last man had gone, the birds came into London, all the birds that sing. When they first saw me, they all looked sideways at me. Then they went away a little, and spoke among themselves. He only sinned against man, they said. It is not our quarrel. Let us be kind to him, they said. Then they hopped near me and began to sing, and it was the time of the rising of the dawn, and from both banks of the river, and from the sky, and from the thickets that had once been streets, hundreds of birds were singing. As the light increased, the birds sang more and more. They grew thicker and thicker in the air above my head, until there were thousands of them singing there, and then millions, and at last I could see nothing but the host of flickering wings with the sunlight on them, and little gaps of sky. Then, when there was nothing to be heard in London but the myriad notes of that exalted song, my soul rose up from the bones in the hole in the mud, and began to climb heavenward and it seemed that a laneway opened amongst the wings of the birds, and it went up and up, and one of the smaller gates of paradise stood ajar at the end of it. And then I knew by a sign that the mud should receive me no more, for suddenly I found that I could weep. At this moment I opened my eyes in bed in a house in London, and outside some sparrows were twittering in a tree in the light of the radiant morning and there were tears still wet upon my face, for one's restraint is feeble while one sleeps. But I arose and opened the window wide, and stretching my hands out over the little garden, I blessed the birds, whose song had woken me up from the troubled and terrible centuries of my dream. The End of Where the Tides Ebb and Flow by Lord Dunsinane The Wolf and the Shepherds by Gotthold Ephraim Lessing, 1729 to 1781. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The rapacious wolf, advanced in years, formed the hypocritical resolution of endeavoring to cajole the shepherds, and in the first instance repaired to him whose flock was nearest to his den. Shepherd, said he, you call me a bloodthirsty felon, which I really am not. No doubt, when I am hungry, I have recourse to your sheep, for hunger is unbearable. Protect me from hunger feed me well and you shall have no cause to complain for i assure you that i am the most tame and tender of animals when my appetite is satisfied when your appetite is satisfied answered the shepherd but is it ever satisfied you and the miser never have enough go your way thus discarded the wolf applied to a second shepherd and accosted him shepherd you need not be told that i can kill many of your sheep in the course of a year will you allow me six sheep at once every year discard your dogs and sleep in peace six sheep replied the shepherd why that is a whole flock 
well as it is you rejoined the wolf i will be satisfied with five five sheep in the whole year i scarcely sacrifice more than five sheep to pan then four continued the wolf while the shepherd shook his head three two not one was the shepherd's answer i will never be so foolish as to pay tribute to an enemy against whom i can protect myself by my own vigilance three is a lucky number thought the wolf and repaired to a third shepherd i am much grieved said he that i am looked upon by your shepherds as the most cruel and remorseless of animals i will prove to you how much i am wronged give me a sheep every year and your flock shall graze in safety in yonder forest which i alone make unsafe one sheep only what a trifle can i be more moderate can i deal more disinterestedly you laugh shepherd what excites your mirth oh nothing but how old are you my good friend replied the shepherd how can my age concern you i am quite young enough to kill your finest sheep growled the wolf do not grow angry old isgrim i am sorry that you came with your proposal seven years too late your broken teeth betray you you are disinterested only in the hope of feeding more comfortably and with less danger the wolf became very surly but composed himself and sought the fourth shepherd who having just lost his faithful dog he deemed the opportunity favourable shepherd he began i have quarrelled with my brethren in the woods and shall never be reconciled to them you know how much you have to fear in that quarter but take me into your service in the place of your deceased dog and i pledge myself that they shall no longer look suspiciously on your sheep you wish replied the shepherd to protect my sheep from your brethren in the woods certainly what else can i mean that might do well enough replied the shepherd but who in that event is to protect my poor sheep against you the expedient of taking a thief into the house to protect us from the thieves out of it we men consider i understand you interrupted the wolf you are beginning to moralize good day if i were not so old muttered the wolf but alas i must yield to time and so he proceeded to the fifth shepherd do you know me shepherd asked the wolf i at least am acquainted with your equals returned the shepherd my equals that i much doubt i am a very singular wolf and worthy of your friendship and that of the other shepherds indeed in what does your singularity consist i could not murder and devour a living sheep even to save my life i feed on mutton only is not that praiseworthy allow me therefore to call now and then on your flock to inquire whether spare your civility answered the shepherd if i am no longer to be your enemy you must refrain from feeding on sheep dead or alive a beast who feeds on dead sheep when hungry will be tempted to regard sick ones as dead and healthy ones as ailing do not therefore count on my friendship but be gone i must now venture everything to attain my purpose thought the wolf as he repaired to the sixth shepherd shepherd how do you like my skin demanded the wolf your skin answered the shepherd let me see it is a very handsome one the dogs have but seldom assailed you well then listen shepherd i am old and cannot go on thus much longer and i will bequeath you my skin how said the shepherd have you found out the miserly trick of selling the skin on the back no no your skin would in the end cost me more than it is worth but if you are resolved to make me a present of it give it me now so saying the shepherd grasped a spear and the wolf took to flight oh the merciless crew exclaimed the wolf in extreme rage i will die as becomes their enemy before i am killed with hunger they will not have it otherwise he immediately ran back into the dwellings of the shepherds attacked and tore their children to pieces and it was with much trouble that the shepherds at length killed him 
we have acted indiscreetly said the wisest among them we should not have driven the old robber to the last extremity forced and late though his repentance was end of the wolf and the shepherds by gotthold ephraim lessing seventeen twenty nine to seventeen eighty one Bratislav by H. H. Munro, Saki. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Tomlinson, London. Bratislav by H. H. Munro. The Grafin's two elder sons had made deplorable marriages. It was, observed Clovis, a family habit. The youngest boy, Vratislav, who was the black sheep of a rather greyish family, had as yet made no marriage at all. There is certainly this much to be said for viciousness, said the Grafin. It keeps boys out of mischief. Does it? asked the Baroness Sophie, not by way of questioning the statement, but with a painstaking effort to talk intelligently. It was the one matter in which she attempted to override the decrees of providence, which had obviously never intended that she should talk otherwise than inanely. I don't know why I shouldn't talk cleverly, she would complain. My mother was considered a brilliant conversationalist. These things have a way of skipping one generation, said the Graffin. "'That seems so unjust,' said Sophie. "'One doesn't object to one's mother having outshone one as a clever talker. "'But I must admit that I should be rather annoyed if my daughters talked brilliantly.' "'Well, none of them do,' said the Graffin consolingly. "'I don't know about that,' said the Baroness, promptly veering round in defence of her offspring. "'Elsa said something quite clever on Thursday about the Triple Alliance.' something about it being like a paper umbrella. That was all right as long as you didn't take it out in the rain. It's not everyone who could say that. Everyone has said it, at least every one I know, but then I know very few people. I don't think you're particularly agreeable today. I never am. Haven't you noticed that women with a really perfect profile like mine are seldom even moderately agreeable? "'I don't think your profile is so perfect as all that,' said the Baroness. "'It would be surprising if it wasn't. "'My mother was one of the most noted classical beauties of her day.' "'These things sometimes skip a generation, you know,' put in the Baroness, "'with the breathless haste of one whom repartee comes as rarely "'as the finding of a gold-handled umbrella.' "'My dear Sophie,' said the Graffin sweetly, "'that isn't in the least bit clever, but you do try so hard "'that I suppose I oughtn't to discourage you. "'Tell me something. "'Has it ever occurred to you that Elsa would do very well for Vratislav? "'It's time he married somebody, and why not Elsa?' "'Elsa married that dreadful boy,' gasped the Baroness. "'Beggars can't be choosers,' observed the Graffin. "'Elsa isn't a beggar.' not financially or i shouldn't have suggested the match but she's getting on you know and has no pretensions to brains or looks or anything of that sort you seem to forget that she's my daughter that shows my generosity but seriously i don't see what there is against vratislav he has no debts at least nothing worth speaking about but think of his reputation if half the things they say about him are true "'Probably three-quarters of them are. "'But what of it? "'You don't want an archangel for a son-in-law?' "'I don't want Vratislav. "'My poor Elsa would be miserable with him. "'A little misery wouldn't matter very much with her. "'It would go so well with the way she does her hair. "'And if she couldn't get on with Vratislav, "'she could always go and do good among the poor.' "'The Baroness picked up a framed photograph from the table.' He certainly is very handsome, she said doubtfully, adding even more doubtfully, I dare say dear Elsa might reform him. The Graffin had the presence of mind to laugh in the right key.
Three weeks later, the Graffin bore down upon the Baroness Sophie in a foreign bookseller's shop in the Graben, where she was possibly buying books of devotion, though it was the wrong counter for them. "'I've just left the dear children at the Rodenstiles,' was the Graffin's greeting. "'Were they looking very happy?' asked the Baroness. "'Vratislav was wearing some new English clothes, so, of course, he was quite happy.' I overheard him telling Tony a rather amusing story about a nun and a mousetrap, which won't bear repetition. Elsa was telling everyone else a witticism about the Triple Alliance being like a paper umbrella, which seems to bear repetition with Christian fortitude. Did they seem much wrapped up in each other? To be candid, Elsa looked as if she were wrapped up in a horse rug, and why let her wear saffron colour? I always think it goes with her complexion. Unfortunately, it doesn't. It stays with it. Ugh! Don't forget, you're lunching with me on Thursday. The Baroness was late for her luncheon engagement the following Thursday. Imagine what has happened! She screamed as she burst into the room. Something remarkable to make you late for a meal, said the Graffin. Elsa has run away with the Rodenstall chauffeur. Colossal! Such a thing as that no one in our family has ever done, gasped the Baroness. Perhaps he didn't appeal to them in the same way, suggested the Graffin judicially. The Baroness began to feel that she was not getting the astonishment and sympathy to which her catastrophe entitled her. At any rate, she snapped, now she can't marry Vratislav. She couldn't in any case, said the Graffin. He left suddenly for abroad last night. For abroad? where for mexico i believe mexico but what for why mexico the english have a proverb conscience makes cowboys of us all i didn't know vratislav had a conscience my dear sophie he hasn't it's other people's consciences that send one abroad in a hurry let's go and eat end of vratislav by h h munro Recording by Peter Tomlinson, London.